Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Titanic uh, podcast for another episode of Titanic month and today I am joined by oh, an amazing um, um, descendant of a survivor but what a human emotional story and I know we've talked about it a little bit earlier before we started recording but I am here with Dr Shelley Binder, is that how you pronounce your name right, Shelley? Binder. Oh, Binder. Ah, mm. I mean, it's, it's always confusing, really, just to uh, how to like pronounce different names, really. But uh, Shelley, thank you so much for coming on today. It, it's been an absolute pleasure to actually have you on today. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Shelley, um, you have like a little bit of history because from what I understand, you work at University of Tennessee and you are a music teacher? Yes, I retired um, two years ago, but I taught for 26 years. I'm a classical flutist. Ah, so how long have you been playing the flute for? Well, I would say 50 years. Here in the States, when you go to um, sixth grade, they introduce you to music and see if you have any interest. And so you go, typically, I remember going to the music room and they had all the instruments just laid out and you go and they let you try them and see if anything sparks your interest. And I remember just seeing the flute and they had the cases there. And uh, I remember thinking that the case looked like a little purse and it was really cute. And uh, that's how I started playing the flute in wow. sixth grade. I think there's a certain um, ability, innate ability that people have to um, read music and to understand it. And uh, I think that's important too. I think, you know, it's important to have an interest in it for sure. But what helps is to have that innate ability to read the music well and, and understand theory. And, um, it, and if you love it, it helps because as it gets more complicated and you go to music school or conservatory, um, the music theory and the music history is quite challenging. And so if you really don't love it and you really don't have a lot of innate ability, it becomes pretty soul crushing. So it's important to have both. Uh, definitely, because um, it, it's like you have to have the passion for it and to actually um, what was the word I'm looking for? Just to just to go along with it, and then just enjoy the hobby. And that that's so great that it led you up to be a music teacher. But then speaking of that, Shelley, you have a connection to the Titanic as well, because um, you are related uh, to Leah Akers. Uh, is that how the pronounced name? Axe. Oh, Axe. 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 Mm -hmm. And um, she is your great grandmother. And also you have a great uncle called Philly. And uh, they both were survivors of the Titanic, but they traveled as third class passengers. It's so wonderful just to have a look at another story from another point of view, because there are so many stories that haven't been told really, because when you think of Titanic survivors, you would normally think of men like John Jacob Astor, and then the unsinkable Molly Brown. But it's always really important to get every single story told and when I read Leah and uh, Philly's story it, it was just like a human emotion there was a big roller coaster and it ended up to not, not only being like a, a, a bit of a bad experience for Leah but then also it got you interested in the Titanic through some very special bits that your husband gave you which we'll, we'll probably talk about um, in the minute so Shelley we're gonna leave you over to uh, you having your story because you told a story um in um the newspaper article from the Fox News back in 2018 2019 where you taught your students at Tennessee about the Titanic that was a class it, it was not related to my music teaching flute teaching it was um, a request that the administration made to all tenured professors that if they had some other interest some hobby some other um, interest that they had that they volunteer to teach a class in that hobby to first year students. And the idea was that it, it wanted students to be able to take a class that was not threatening, that was not scary or uh, heavy on research or, or, you know, 
not difficult or threatening in any way, but to get to know a professor as a human being and to see that they had interests, they had stories to share that with them. And so that they, they were able to see that we were on their side and that we were just people and uh, kind of connect in that way. And it's interesting because some of the kids that took the class, none of them were in music. Um, they were all in the university <clears throat> in different fields, various fields. And uh, there were other classes that they could have taken. Uh, some of the other classes were interesting. There was one called chocolate tasting. Oh. Uh, yeah, that one filled up quite fast. <laughs> and then there were some that just showed an, a professor had an interest in, in football and taught a class on football in this country uh, and, you know, various other, other fun topics that people had. And uh, so I don't know how many people actually went to sign up for the chocolate tasting or the football and found that they were full and as a result, they had to take a class on the Titanic. I'm not sure. I do know that some of the kids that I taught were definitely um, enthusiasts themselves and had and a level of knowledge before they started the course. Um, so that was, that was great to really um, interact with them. And as a field trip, we went to a Titanic museum here, near here, near where I live. And... Uh, so that was, that was a lot of fun. This is something I've seen my whole life because of course I, my earliest memories are, this was our, my family used to call it our, our claim to infamy. So of course, from the time I was a littlest child, I knew about this. And of course I knew my great grandmother and my great uncle, but as I got older, uh, it became very clear to me that the Titanic is everywhere. It became obvious that it's one of the greatest metaphors for so many things and used in the weirdest and most diverse way. And so just exactly what you're talking about, I started a, uh, a blog on, it's on Facebook. It's actually called Titanic References in Pop Culture. And people are encouraged to post memes, either satirical memes that involve the Titanic, using it as some kind of a, uh, a metaphor for hubris or pride or disaster. Or, and some things, you know, a lot of things will relate to the camera movie um, and silly things like, you know, there's enough room on the door for Jack to get on the door with uh, Rose or uh, but it's, it's amazing to me, the people in every walk of life, science, history, pop culture, use the Titanic in some way to, to indicate um, all kinds of, of uh, things. You know, so some are just science related. You know, here's how it sank. And if you put this many, you know, thousands of tons of water in a bow of a ship that has you know, incredibly uh, heavy engines in, in the back. This is what's going to happen. So it's fascinating to me. I don't think there's a day that goes by that somebody doesn't post in that group another reference to the Titanic in the most extraordinary ways. And it's interesting that politically around the world, because I have members from all over the world, people will use in their memes, in their newspapers and magazines and online, the Titanic as some kind of impending doom, and not just in our government, but I've seen it in many, many uh, countries using it as a, as a kind of warning. And it's, it's fascinating. Titanic is everywhere. It's, it's almost bigger now than it was ever. Anyway, we're going to be probably moving on because we definitely need to touch on Leah's story, Shelley. So okay. um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, Leah's life um, before the Titanic? Well, in the late 1890s, I'm not sure exactly when, um, there was quite a lot of violence towards Jews in Poland and Europe. And 
um, at a certain point, her brother, her older brother, Solomon, was afraid of being conscripted into the Russian army because, of course, at that time, Warsaw, it was Warsaw, Russia at the time. And to avoid this, uh, he was probably only, I don't know, 15, 16. They sent him first over and he made his way to London, the East End of London. And he worked and Solomon is actually the one who got the rest of his family out of Poland, Russia at the time. So they, uh, I'm not even exactly sure of the, the year, something I'm researching. They traveled, it was um, my great-grandmother and her brother, Marx, and her brother, Abraham, and their two parents, Morris and Annie, who made their way to meet their brother, their son and brother, uh, Solomon, in London. And so she was a young girl, and as such, she was educated in England, and uh, their original language was Yiddish. And so being educated in London from a young age, she spoke, you know, perfect English. Her father was a baker. And uh, I think they, as I said, her older brother, Solomon, he stayed in, in London and his great grandchildren still live there. That's really interesting because I know that you have um, family connections in London. Um, like you said before we started the interview, Shelley, because um, you, you have different um, family connections uh, from um, UK and the US, I believe. Yeah, my great grandmother and my great grandfather. Uh, well, actually, my great grandfather's family, some of his siblings also came to the US. But as far as my great grandmother goes, she she was the only one. Now her brother Abraham did come off and on and live here, but he has no descendants. But uh, her other brother Marx died relatively young. He he died in England, but Solomon had you know a lot of children and uh, you know a great life and lived there and. All of his descendants still live in London. When Leah moved to London with her family, she ended up getting married and having the little boy, who's your great uncle, Philly, um, whose name I believe was Philip, but he was called Philly in the family. Right. Um, his name was Frank Philip, and he was named after his grandfather, and it translates from the Yiddish to approximate Frank Philip, but he was uh, always known in an immediate family as Phil. He was my uncle Phil. Now, a lot of Titanic circles uh, call him Frank. And as, a, as an adult, he went by Frank. And, you know, I, my thinking on that and is that my family business, and you probably don't know this, was that we owned a junkyard. And that was our business. Uh, so I think if you're gonna be a man's man and you're gonna work in the scrap metal business and salvage and you're gonna be a mechanic, the name Philip might be a little bit not manly enough. So he decided to go by Frank. So if you talk to anybody in his immediate family, he's Philip. If you talk to other Titanic resources or whatever you see it is Frank, Frank Axe. He always went by Frank Axe. And he became very um, enamored with his own history as being a Titanic survivor. And in, I believe, 1985, uh, actually before that, the Titanic Historical Society started and invited him to conventions. And he loved it. He loved going there. And of course, you know, if you're invited to go to Boston and New York. It's quite a fun departure from the junkyard. Um, but he, he really took an interest in that and he had a lot of, you know, fun with it, I think. And, uh, he, uh, he did a number of interviews and whatever. The thing that I admire about my great uncle is that every time, and this is true of me, it's true of my mother, it's true of my grandmother, it's true of, true of all of us. When something happens about the ship, they come looking for us, the press. So for instance, I think they sought him out when they found the Titanic in 1985. And, and then I can go on newspaper archives and find literally hundreds of interviews of my great uncle. And he never lied. He never made anything up about knowing anything about that night because 
he was 10 months old. He didn't know anything. And he was always very honest about that. So I, I admire him for that. Oh, it, it definitely sounds like um, he, he was very truthful, especially after everything that Leah went through. And then um, during uh, the process of the Titanic, um, Leah and Sam somehow um, had the decision to emigrate to America. But of course, Sam went to America first uh, just to start um, his new life. But I never really knew um, did, if Sam had a job already before he emigrated to America or did he um, have a family business to join or what happened? That is such an interesting story. And believe it or not, Sarah, this is evolving even in my research. In 1908, my great grandfather and his brother Abraham got on a boat. He was actually hit, I just quickly, his story of getting out of Europe was even more exciting because he was from a village called Lodz or Wodz, L-O-D-Z, very close to Warsaw in Poland. They didn't know each other, uh, but they happened to be very, from a similar region. But there was terrible violence uh, in that village. And I believe that his father was killed. Ter terrible, really awful, awful violence. And they called them pogroms. And, where they were just wholesale killing Jews and, and torturing them and torturing their businesses. And so I think after his father died, him and his brothers had no choice but to help his mother with her other children. She had young children and no husband. So the only thing that they had was my great grandfather was very tall and very strong and he was a boxer. Boxing was very big in the early part of the 20th century in the 1900s. It was very big and he was very good at it. So him and his brother took off and they just walked out of Europe and it took a year and a half and they uh, boxed each other, boxing exhibitions. And they also, I think, boxed other people in matches maybe for money. Um, and he was, he must've been 15, 14, 15. And so finally they got to Hamburg and they finally got it. I don't know what he did to get the money to get the passage from Hamburg over to London, but he did. And so he made it over to the East end of London and they, um, he stayed there for a number of months or whatever until he could gain passage, get enough money to come to the US because he had an interest in cars and cars were, were just becoming a big thing in uh, the early 1900s and he was determined. Not only what did he want to work in cars, but he wanted to work in cars in this country. And he's the one, he had absolute determination that he was coming to America, come hell or high water. And pretty much both of those two things did happen. And so they got the money and him and his brother got on the Celtic in 1908. And they came over and they got to Ellis Island and his brother got in, but he had the chicken pox. He had caught the chicken pox on the two week journey. And they sent him back. They oh. denied him access to this country. And so after everything he had been through, they put him right back on the same ship he had come over on and sent him back to, to Southampton. And he, that's, if he hadn't have, gotten the chicken pox I probably wouldn't be here because that's when he went back that's when he met my great-grandmother uh, oh. and they got married and of course as soon as he could what did he do he got the money again to come over and it's very interesting because along the way he was afraid that he couldn't come in again on his own name because he had heard that once you were kicked out for some whatever reason uh you couldn't come back in. And that wasn't an option for him because he was going to be here and he was going to become an American, period. The, just He was a fighter and he wasn't going to give up on that. There's just no way. So he went back to London and I think created a fake name. Oh, The name was Axman. Three documents that have this name and then it was never to be heard of again. The 1911 census listed them as Sam and Leah Axman. I know it's them because it has the right address, 20, 25 Brunswick. 
The next thing was their marriage license. The third document was my uncle Phil's birth certificate from London in 1911. And after that, you never hear of the name Axman ever again, because that wasn't our family name. Our name was Ax. I've done a lot of research in Poland, um, today's Poland, and um, I found my family there. And Axman, A-K-S-M-A-N, is a Polish name, but it's not a Jewish name. And A-K-S is a Jewish name, and it means Axel. And so I think that my family might have been in the business of making Axels for carts, maybe. Um, and that's maybe where he even got his interest in cars. And, you know, a lot of Titanic museums you'll go to, and they have the story about Axman, he, that she married a man named Sam Axman. It's not true. In the end, after researching it, he came over on his own name in 1911 on the Haverford. But, you know, there was no computers. So instead of going from Southampton to New York to Ellis Island, he just got by it by going from Liverpool to Philadelphia. And of course, no one would ever in 1911 have the resources to know that this man named Sam Ax had previously been in. So in the end, after creating this little fake name, he came in on his own name, Sam Ax. I have the manifest on the, the uh, SS Haverford in September. September 18th, he arrived here of 1911. Funny, it's my, my husband's birthday, September 18th. So he came over and to answer your question, I'm sorry, I'm so long-winded. I Please forgive me. Um, his brother Abraham had been here because he came in 1908. He got in uh -huh. and he had established a business. Of course, they had been in the junk business. In fact, that was quite a, a business, I guess, for people. And, you know, because Nobody had anything. So people made use of everything. And um, I think that my great grandfather, when he uh, made it to my home, eventual hometown where my uh, great uncle was, he worked um, in, he was called a tailor. But I think what he did was he was interested in machines. So I think he worked on sewing machines. And I think he might have sold sewed on machines, maybe industrial clothing, that kind of thing. But of course, if you know anything about, you know, that part of that uh, time period, and you look up manifest, it seems like everybody was a tailor, you know, almost everybody in my family, tailor or tailoress. Um, and of course, you know, everybody needed clothes. So it was quite the business to be in. And, and then junk, it was also a way to make a living in this country, not probably every country, um, in the early part of the uh, 20th century. So he came over to the town my great uncle had established in. First it was Baltimore and then it was Norfolk, Virginia. And it was right on the coast of Virginia, right almost dead across from the, where the Titanic sank. So yeah. I'm from the coast of Virginia, and that's where they emigrated to. What an interesting story, really, of, of Sam's history. I mean, it, it is like a coincidence, really, when you think about it, but it is definitely mind-blowing. And, um, of course, with Sam settling into Virginia, um, he managed uh, to um, pay off his wages to get Leah and uh, Frank tickets uh, to sail on the Titanic, which they left from Southampton. They did, but... He didn't pay for the whole ticket because her family, who didn't really want her to go, this was their only daughter. She, I don't even know that she really wanted to go, but he was determined. And so she followed him, but her family said, and you know, it's very difficult. It's very dangerous to cross the North, the, the Atlantic. It's still dangerous. It's, it's a very dangerous uh, ocean between you and me across the pond so to speak. So they said, well, we don't want you to go on any ship. And so if you agree to wait three months, we will make up the cost of the ticket 
and we will send you over on the sh safest ship ever built. Oh, of course, everyone says that, that the Titanic was the safest ship, really, but then it turns out not every ship is safe. And um, there was always a legend that saying that, that the, some of the shipbuilders and the shipbuilders magazine in the Titanic um, labelled um, the Titanic practically unsinkable, which, which isn't true because there's no such thing as uh, practically unsinkable, is there? No, because you, you can't account for a freak accident. And that's really what took that ship down. Something that even though they had really thought of a lot of what could happen and shipbuilding had really gotten to a very high level in terms of safety. Um, and the Titanic was had so many, people don't talk about it, but there was not only um, a lot of safety measures, but there was a lot of technology that was new that was employed in terms of um, the engines and you know these giant engines, but it also recycled the condensation from the steam into a turbine engine, and it 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 uh, had these large um, batteries called dynamo that they stored this power. It, it was quite advanced actually, in other ways, and it had this one flaw that was kind of um, aesthetic because they didn't want to carry these bulkheads. Uh, uh, pie, you know, to their full height, which they normally would, uh, because they wanted to make it, um, the inside of the ship, even more beautiful. And of course, in the end, no one could foresee uh, a, a situation where the ship would hit along the side and bounce along, opening up the number of, of watertight compartments that it did. And that was completely, um, it never happened. So, you know, people speculate, well, if it had hit head on, um, it, it would have survived the ship, meaning, meaning the ship. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I get asked this question a lot and I think it would have survived, but a lot of people would have died mm -hmm. because the way the ship was divided was that in the bow of the ship, single men were traveling. And of course they housed crewmen, stokers and other seamen. And then the middle part of the ship were families traveling together. And of course, you know, the first, the second and first class um, cabins. And then in the rear of the ship were, were women traveling alone, mostly with their, their babies and third class. And, you know, a huge number of people would have died uh, as well if that ship had hit head on. Mm -hmm. It might have not sunk but there would have been a great loss of life in my oh, opinion oh yeah definitely and i know that there was this one theory that um in a documentary i watched oh well it was filmed back in 1998 and they and uh, there was a team that did a water experiment where if cats and smith are uh, left all open on all of the watertight compartments, the ship would have rolled onto its side and um, the ship would have sunk about 35 minutes earlier and a lot more people could have died. You know, it's funny if, you, if you're gonna talk about conspiracy theories because, you know, I hear this all the time and um, there was a coal fire. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've heard about the bunker, coal bunker fire. If it weren't for that coal bunker fire, I wouldn't be having this conversation. The bunker was, it was smoldering. It wasn't burning like a, a fire a conflagration. It was just a smoldering. And it was not unusual, by the way. It was something that happened, okay? So they knew about it. It was there before they even left and it wasn't a big deal. So along those four days, they started to move the coal from those bunkers away. They moved it to the port side into other bunkers. And they, of course, were starting to use it. So this ship was actually listing slightly to the port because they had taken so much coal from the starboard side in order to mitigate this coal fire. It wasn't a coal fire, smoldering coals. Um, had they not done that, and the ship hit on the starboard, and of course all of this water starts to rush in on the starboard, um, it equaled out. So if it had been equal to begin with, the ship would have rolled over and capsized to the starboard. Mm. 
And so because there was more weight on the port side because of the extra coal, it equaled the ship out and it, it, it helped it not to capsize. And that's, that's, that's true. And I believe that coal fire, which in my mind is insignificant to have anything whatsoever to do with the sinking, uh, actually in the end saved my life. It's really incredible just to think how a different bits can actually, oh, just the fate always brings in strange things. And um, I, I really couldn't believe um, when you said how the coal bunker fire saved your family's life, which is absolutely incredible because um, being third class passengers traveling on the Titanic, uh, Leah and especially Frank, they wouldn't know what was happening with the coal bunker. And um, they wouldn't know about so many other things, except um, that she might have felt a little jar or bump when the Titanic struck the iceberg because I believe that so many third class passengers did because since they were at the bottom of the ship, they knew quickly that something was wrong before the first or second class passengers did. Well, Sarah, I can tell you definitively because I have her newspaper account. She had no idea the ship had hit anything. She was preparing for bed. It, it, she wasn't really asleep yet, but someone knocked on her door. Probably one of these young women that she had made friends with, maybe her age or who had a baby as well, and said, do you know the ship hit something? And she said, no, I had no idea. And so she said, well, you know, our children are sleeping. Let's just go up and have a look. So the two of them walked up to the aft well deck. And there, you know, there was nobody except a few crewmen. And uh, they said, you know, is the ship in any danger? And the crewman said, no, of course not. Not at all. Go back to bed. Oh. Mm. Oh, that, that's so, a little bit of a stern way to put that, really. Well, a lot of people, you know, I mean, that's, that is part of the story where, you know, they, they did tell third class, you know, I mean, people got various stories. I mean, it, it, and I, first class, you know, come up to the boat deck with your life preservers. Third class, go back to bed. You see the difference there, really, when, when you absolutely think about it. But then, um, of course, when uh, Leah um, heard about it and then she wasn't really convinced or she knew something was really up, um, she took Frank and um, she tried to get up onto the boat deck. But of course, with a lot of people, um, probably, I don't know whether this is true or not, but it's been said as a conspiracy theory so many times that third class passengers were locked in by crew members. But of course, um, this may or may not be true because some of the gangways were locked anyway. And um, there were impossible ways to actually um, go up to the boat deck because most of the third class passengers didn't speak a word of English. But Leah managed to get out somehow. And I don't really know if it was true, but I heard that there was a human ladder that she and Frank managed to uh, get up on the boat decks from from the third class decks. Absolutely, we we know in her own words what happened. Um, this is not in question at all. So she, you know, had the opportunity or good luck to have just been curious enough to go leave third class early in the the accident and went up with his friend just probably I mean when you were 18 you were probably curious too and thought oh yeah this will be something to do let's just go up and have a look while she was there after the crewman said you know okay nothing nothing happening here go back to bed um they just hung around for a while all of a sudden rockets start going off which was unexpected to say the very least um and then they go over to the side of the ship just to look out and she sees something that really made her blood run cold. And that was a lifeboat in the water because the ship had stopped and they had, you know, the boiler, a lot of steam ahead of steam. They had to release the steam because otherwise the boilers would explode. Mm -hmm. So when they were expelling the steam, it was causing the steam whistles to go off at full blast. You know, it wasn't, ooh, ooh, it was continuous. And it was so loud that 
you could scream in someone's face and you could not hear a thing. And it went on for 50 minutes, nearly an hour, and it was deafening. And so they, she went back down and they got their babies. Now, after the steam went off, woke everybody up. So now everybody's pouring up these companion ways, uh, trying to get, get out. And so now it's crowded and she's pushing her way through. When they made it up to the, the aft well deck, which was the sea deck, um, it was crowded and everybody was panicking. Well, there was two staircases going up uh, the sides and they had a, a gate that was locked. It was waist high. Um, and the reason it was locked was that it wasn't nefarious. It was that the people in third class most of them did not have passports. They were emigrating. And so if you imagine the people in second and first class were either tourists visiting the US or businessmen visiting the US, they had passports and they, they weren't confined behind gates, but third class was. So they were released uh, into the country when at Ellis Island when they went through customs, if you can imagine. So I'm 62 years old and just had a hip replaced, okay? If, I, if my life depended on it, I could get over that gate, okay? Mm -hmm. It wasn't the gate that necessarily was the problem, but these two very narrow staircases. Now there might've been crewmen at the top trying to keep people from going over it, mm -hmm. but you can imagine they were very narrow. Um, and hundreds of people pushing their way up. It was a log jam. You couldn't do anything. So she says that she and a bunch of other women were just sitting there and just couldn't do anything accepting their fate. And some crewmen, young crewmen or young men, heroic men, look down and see that these women had no means of, of trying to save themselves. They had no way to get to the, the, the lifeboats, which were on the boat deck. Now keep in mind, you have C deck, and then the staircase goes from C deck up to B deck. Now, uh, then you have to go from B deck to A deck, and then the boat deck was above A deck. So it was quite a way to go. Now, some of the lifeboats were, were, were dropped down from the boat deck to A deck um, and filled that way. Um, but that still meant you had to go from C deck up to B deck, cross that gate uh, in that throng of people and get to the A deck. So what happened was these heroic men, she said they were like acrobats in a circus, jumped down, you know, I mean, there were these giant uh, cranes, cargo cranes, and they had these big housings. And I imagined that they jumped down um, on these cranes, maybe then on the housing, maybe then on the, the hatch cover of the cargo um, thing. And then they formed a human ladder of, uh, you know, probably, in fact, if you want to see in one of my classes, I actually uh, recreated this with my students. And I, um, at the university that I taught at, it's a big football school. Oh, wow. So I got the cheerleaders because they knew how to lift people up to see what it was like. And so I got a, an actual Titanic historian. His name is Bill Wormstadt, very well known. Um, he came up from South Carolina to make sure it was accurate. And of course, one deck was nine feet, which is quite a distance. Okay. And the other one was nine and a half. And then the, you know, distance of the railing mm -hmm. and we showed you could see it if you google um you know my name and then titanic university of tennessee you'll see um where i was going to use the students but it was too dangerous actually to lift people up like that so i hired the i didn't hire i asked them to do this and they were gracious enough to do it and i told the young men on the cheerleading team don't do this the right way. You know, these men had no idea how to lift people the appropriate way, or they weren't athletes like you are. You're just young men trying to help women survive, these women and children. And it's just 
however you can think of at, you know, it, we, I, I'm thinking that she got out very late, uh, probably at 10 to two uh, and the ship sank at, tw- at 220. It was a mad scramble. And so it was probably something like step on my knee, step on my shoulder, step on my head, pass to the next man. And she did this. And of course, then you had to put your foot on a deck and go over a three and a half foot railing. And my, my friend Bill said she would have to let go of the baby because you can't get across the railing holding a baby. And I said, no, no, no. She always said she traveled together. She never let go of the baby. It was a thing with her because she could not accept losing possession of that baby. She said, no, no, we, we, we went together the whole way. But it's true. I actually bought a doll, um, the biggest doll I could find. And I weighted the, the doll down with 20 pounds of sand. And I had this cheerleader carry this doll. And when she put her foot on, we had an actual piece of equipment from the football team, uh, a scissor lift, and we raised it to exactly the right height. There was no way she could get over it holding the baby. So somebody had to take the baby mm-hmm. away from her so she could get across. So um, that's how she lost the baby, could, you know, track of the baby. And so because it was so late in the sinking, there were crewmen. And it, what I think is really interesting, as I do more and more research, there was a man uh, who was the ship's baker. He was, he was featured actually in the movie because there's kind of a funny story about him. Oh, yeah, that's Charles Jocklin. Yes, that he had gone to his cabin and, you know, had a half a bottle of whiskey to steady his nerves. But then when he did go out, he was quite heroic. And it's thought then, because it was so close to the, the end, that they were on the port side because the boat was listing, the lifeboats were hanging away from the ship. So it was even more perilous because you had to step over a huge gap to get in. And it's pitch black and you're looking down, maybe, you know, the star shine, there's no moon that night and the stars are shining on the water 70 feet below probably even more than that because by this point the stern of the ship was out of the water so it was higher even than 70 feet and you had to jump across this chasm to get into a lifeboat well these men were literally throwing children in and so what I think happened was that they took the baby to help her and they she out of the corner of her eye saw somebody throwing him into a lifeboat but she didn't see the lifeboat because the lifeboat was hanging lower and away from the ship. So she thought he was being thrown into the sea. She says at that point she fainted. And then she, you know, assumed that somebody else put her in a lifeboat. Oh, wow. I mean, this is different from what I actually heard, because from what I heard, and I know this may or may not be true, but when she, uh, Leah and Frank got up onto the lifeboat, um, I serve to believe because she was around the same age as Leah, Madeline Astor donated her shawl um, to Frank to keep warm. And then straight away from what I heard, because they were on the starboard side from what I believe. And for me, I could be wrong, but that was Charles Lightoller's side because he only just said women and children only. And there was this unidentified crewman who took Frank and he said I'll show you women and children first before he dropped Frank into lifeboat 11 and um, it was straight onto a strange woman's lap and they were lowered down and then Leah in the panic she went into lifeboat number 13 however the it didn't really stop there because lifeboat number 13 almost got crushed by another lifeboat which was lifeboat 15 and she almost died and if um, someone didn't actually stop um lifeboat number 15 being crushed by 13. this is the story that is in most history books and i'm well aware of it and i mean even in interviews of my mother, you know, and my grandmother, the story was that she interacted with Madeline Astor <clears throat> and the, we did have a shawl. I permit me to explain, um, I've done a lot of research since these books have been written. There were not a whole lot of people doing research on the Titanic until Walter Lord started to do research. 
serious primary source research. People were writing books um, and the next person just took what that person said in spite of any current research that was done. And then the next person took the research from that person and maybe some of the new stuff and on and on and on. And it wasn't primary source research anymore. It was just considered fact and passed on and it mutated and changed over the years, just like a game of telephone. And there's a shred of the story that was accurate in all of it. The current thinking, and this is not me, but this is, you know, Titanic researchers like Don Lynch and George Behe and Bill Wormstead. These are the premier Titanic researchers now think she did not get into 13 and that Phil did not get into 11 and that she did not meet Madeline Astor on the Titanic and get the scar. She got the scar on the Carpathia. And I, I have to explain when she was so devastated because even on the Carpathia for days, she thought he was dead. She took to a mattress and wouldn't eat, wouldn't get up, nothing. Days went on. They finally convinced her. Of course, the weather was terrible on the Carpathia. People don't know that story either. It was extremely traumatic because as calm as it was on the night of the 14th and early morning of the 15th, now when they got on the Carpathia, it started to storm, which it did for four days all the way back to New York. And thunder, lightning, heavy seas, fog. These people were so traumatized. So eventually after a couple of days, they convinced her to go up on deck to get some air. So she did that. And out of the corner of her eye, she sees a baby reaching out his arms to her. He knew his mother, he was still breastfeeding. He's the one, he reached out his arms to his mother and she sees, and she said, that's my baby. And of course, you know, she had been so traumatized, nobody really believed her. The woman who had him described to me by my own family was an Italian woman who had a crucifix. She was all dressed in black and she wouldn't give him up. So the captain was called and he said, bring both women and the baby up to my cabin. Well, all of the officers of the Carpathia vacated their cabins and gave their cabins to first-class women. Who was staying in Captain Rostron's cabin? Madeline Astor, Marion Thayer, and Eleanor Widener, three of the richest women in the world. And there, they witnessed Arthur Rostron, my hero, act like Solomon from the Bible and determine whose baby that was. Now, because he was only wrapped in like a coat. And of course, you know, it must have been horrible because, you know, baby, they didn't have diapers. So they wrapped him in steamer blankets. Madeline Astor said, your baby looks cold, took off her scarf and wrapped it around, which remained in my family and was only donated to the Mariners Museum a couple decades ago. Wow. And it's still there. But I firmly believe that she did interact with, with Madeline Astor because it was in Captain Rostron's cabin. She was sent there to get her baby back. And Madeline Astor and these other two women were staying in his cabin. The three richest women on the Titanic who were now all widows. And one not only lost her husband, but her son. And not only did they give her a scarf, but one of them gave her a $5 gold piece Wow. She was pitiful. Think about it. And Madeline Astor was 19 and pregnant herself. They felt horrible for her. At least she wasn't a widow like they were. Um, if um, Sam would have uh, traveled with Frank and um, Leah on the Titanic, things would be very, very different. I wouldn't and, be here. And of course, on the Carthapia, as you just told me, Shelley, it's um, it was quite different to what it was before because uh, Captain Arthur uh, Rostrum got involved and eventually Frank was given back to Leah. But as soon as they got to New York City, Leah had a breakdown, a mental breakdown, and she had to have some uh, um, additional help, didn't she? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> sadly, because of the weather and because the Carpathia was a much smaller ship, the Marconi equipment didn't have the range that the, the, the Titanic had. And of course, that was impeded by the weather as well. So they first transmitted the names of first class 
and they had to do it one at a time. And of course, some people had, you know, strange names. So they're transmitting these names. By the way, Harold Cottom, the, the Marconi operator on the Carpathia, who is also a hero of mine, um, was helped by um, Harold Bride, who was one of the, the uh, Marconi operators who survived on, from the Titanic. Wow. And they madly, frantically were trying to get these names of the survivors to land. And it was very, very difficult. Um, in fact, President Taft, the, the United States president at the time, had his top aide, aide de camp, um, Archie Butt, on that ship. And, and President Taft was desperate to know if Archie had lived or died. So he, and not only for that reason, he sent out um, the United States Chester um, military ship to meet them in the mid-ocean to try to get these names. Um, funny, because it was out of my hometown, Norfolk. It, oh. I just found that out, yeah, that that ship. So um, then, you know, that, that was probably on the 15th and the 16th, you know, and then it's difficult intermittent where they could even get these out because of the weather. And then they started the second class names and it wasn't until later that week before the Carpathia made it to New York that they started even transmitting the third class names. Oh. So her family in London thought she was dead. Think about it. We're gonna make you stay here three more months until we'll make up the difference until you can, we wanna send you over on the safest ship ever built. Mm -hmm. And now she, they think she's dead mm -hmm. and the baby dead. And finally, a White Star agent comes to the tenement where my great grandfather's staying. He comes out on the porch and is told, your wife and your baby are alive. This was basically on Thursday when the ship was gonna get into port, the Carpathia. Oh. So he supposedly was so freaked out at this news that he fainted, fell off the porch and got a concussion. This is quite some news after you really convince they're dead. And also he was so devastated, he couldn't work those three or four days. So he had no money, right? Mm -hmm. And I think White Star might've given him some money to get up to New York. Uh, I don't know that for a fact, but um, he, it took him until Monday, the 22nd to get up to New York. In the meantime, of course, she wasn't the only one who was in this situation. Um, aid agencies looked after people, uh, these women, like the Red Crescent, the Red Cross, and in her case, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, Hyas, um, met them at the dock. And I think they took maybe 49 women and children, and they weren't all Jewish of any, you know, and that was true of the Red Cross and Red Cross. They all, aid agencies, you know, pitched in and cared for these people. And so she was cared for. She, she went there and she stayed there, uh, you know, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night until uh, her husband could arrive. And I actually recently found the landing card. I went up to New York uh, to, it still exists, the Hebrew American Aid Society. And it, it says that she was picked up on the 22nd by her husband at seven o'clock in the evening, and that they were taken by somebody at the, the aid society who took them to the Pennsylvania Railroad and they took a, you know, railroad back to my hometown. Mm -hmm. She was, it was quicker to go by ferry, but she didn't want to get back on a ship. She, you know, lately I've been thinking about that. I've been thinking about that moment where he gets there and she falls into his arms. You know, she knew nobody else on this continent. She had never been to this continent ever. And he is literally the only human being that she knew. So when they finally got to Norfolk, she did a, 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 an interview actually in our local newspaper the next day which I'm happy to share with you at some point. And she, she does go over a lot of what I've gone through over 
Um, and she did some other interviews. Of course, they had no money. So a lot of Titanic survivors made money by giving interviews. And she was just um, devastated mentally, emotionally. She had what now they know as uh, PTSD, post-traumatic stress. But of course, they didn't really call it that then because that name wasn't really used until at first, after the First World War, I think it was called Shell Shock. And oh. then eventually they got the name uh, post-traumatic stress disorder by her own. I actually also have, she in 1939, I believe she was on a radio show. She was on Robert Ripley's Believe It or Not, the radio show. And actually my Uncle Phil was doing it too. So he was there too. And um, by her own voice, she says, I was in and out of the hospital for 11 months with a nervous collapse. How do you do, Mr. Ripley? How do you do, Frank? I suppose you uh, don't remember much about this terrible experience, do you? No, I was only 10 months old at that time. Tell me, Frank, uh, since that time, have you ever met a woman who saved your life? No, sir. We completely lost track of her. My mother suffered a nervous collapse after that ordeal. I was in the hospital 11 months. I've often wondered who that woman was and where she is. Ladies and gentlemen, if that woman is listening in now, or if anyone knows of her whereabouts, I would appreciate it very much if they would write me a letter to travel forward to Mr. Allen. Thank you, Mr. Ripley. I would certainly love to hear from her. I'd be awfully happy to meet her again soon, Mr. Ripley. I know you do. And thank you, Mrs. Ash, and thank you, Frank. Of course, what happened after 11 months? She ended up being pregnant from um, what I was told. And then um, after, because she had to leave um, the hospital after she was pregnant. And I believe um, the second, her second child was your grandmother. That's right. So she, she actually got pregnant within three months. And my grandmother was born in March. So not quite a year. And I mean, my great grandfather couldn't have cared for a toddler and a newborn she probably needed to stay in. So they turned my baby grandmother, newborn baby grandmother over to a woman who was truly emotionally um, devastated. So it's, it's a very sad story, really. Unfortunately, uh, what happened, and you've probably heard of this too, because you sound very well informed. Um, I don't know if you've heard the story, but it's all over the internet. And my grandmother's birth certificate says that her name is Sarah Titanic X. Mm. And we didn't know that. My grandmother didn't know that. I have her, her high school diploma. I actually ha physically have it. Um, she always went by the name Sarah Carpathia. This was a Catholic hospital and she was probably not really cogently explaining why she wanted to name her child Sarah Carpathia to the nuns. It was probably very excited, very emotional. And the nuns thought she wanted to name her baby Sarah Titanic. And that's all my grandmother's birth certificate. And we, we teased my grandmother mercilessly about that. And she hated it. And I, I truly feel bad because I, I see now that she must have been kind of raving and the nuns misinterpreted what she wanted to name her child. And that's very sad. It's not funny at all. And I mean, my grandmother threatened to haunt us if we put that on her graveside, uh, grave stone. Oh gosh. She was very, very, very devastated and tortured for a number of years. Eventually she kind of got on her feet you know, my uncle Harry, her third child was born in 1915. And um, I think she came out of it. It took a very long time. I mean, it, it, you can imagine really what, what all she went through, really, because I don't really blame your grandmother because uh, I, I would have been in the same position. And then with Leah, it took a little bit of time to recover. But then um, also jumping on through years later, you yourself, Shelley, when you found out about the Titanic, you weren't interested at all and you wanted nothing to do with it. Obviously, we know about it our whole lives, you know, and it was 
talked about and you know people were fascinated by it and, and as I said anything that had to do with the ship you know people would seek them pe- seek my family out um but this ship right behind me actually um in 2012 my husband gave me that ship I wasn't expecting it and so I was surprised by it and I guess I was at a point in my life when all of a sudden as an academic being in that environment, I became more interested in the, the truth of it, not just the legend. And there, you know, so much, so much, I mean, I hope by talking to me, you can see that there's so much misinformation and really how it got out there. It's really important to look at that, to get back to primary source material and not go by this history book which went by that history book, which went by that history book and took, took the material from this history book, which they didn't research it and they didn't know. And they, they weren't pulling from primary source documents or survivor interviews. That was all done by Walter Lord. And that's why I spent a week, two years ago, researching Walter Lord's files at the Caird Library and Maritime Museum in Greenwich in in London. Um, He's the first one really who did such significant research and made an attempt to get the real story and from primary sources. You know, people say, oh, well, Cameron's film was, you know, it wasn't very accurate and he just stole stuff from this movie or that movie. Yeah, it's a lot like A Night to Remember because Walter Lord did the research and Cameron, James Cameron is a titaniac and he used Walter Lord's primary source research. And a lot of the scenes that seem similar between the 1958 movie or even the 1953 movie of which my grandmother, my great grandmother and my great uncle were at the premiere in New York. And I actually have uh, press photos of that Um, which might have been very exciting for somebody whose family owned a junkyard to go to New York to be, you know, at a world premiere. But that's why the camera movie is somewhat similar to A Night to Remember, because that is primary source research. And I stayed there for a week. I could have stayed there for a month every day, eight hours in that library, because he actually did academic research and endeavor to really find the truth. And that's what I started to do in 2012. And I, when I started uncovering all of this nonsense about my family, it made me, it lit a fire under me to really try and get to the bottom of it. And I can't overcome, you know, right away, you know, oh yeah, she, you know, she, her name was Axeman and she was in Lifeboat 13 and he was in 11. I can't overcome that because people are so married to what was in this history book or that history book. And they're not looking at the evidence, which still exists. She talks about her lifeboat picking up people out of the water. Well, 11 or 13 didn't pick people up out of the water. Either she was making that up or, and she also talked about seeing people on the port side of the strip, not the starboard side of the ship. And so there is more research being done by really significant Titanic researchers, but they're having the same problem because it's hard to overcome what's in so many books. No, that the Titanic, it is really, it it plays an important part in people's lives, come what may. But as I was doing um, loads of interviews, including the one we recorded today, Shelley, um, it got me thinking that every single time, a lot of people actually said that James Cameron didn't really know about the research too much because all, all he did was, like, like you said, um, look at Walter Lord's research and then probably copied it in his own film. And then also he dived um, so many times to the Titanic wreck site with fellow explorers. But then um, with that connection, really, with James Cameron, it did make me think twice about the, the weight of the 50-50 situation um, that was there. and. It makes me wonder, really, because you um, people would look through their minds with historians and then with people who 
no um, relatives who actually been at the event and then also uh, looking at divers and scientists a lot of people have like different theories and beliefs of it and then every single time it always makes me think that with the Titanic, there are two things that actually come into my mind about this. There is yellow journalism and there is romanticism because everyone loves a good romance story. Um, that was way before um, Jack and Rose of the Titanic because people just want to sell things for profit. They want the story to be fed to them. Like, don't look at the really reality, really scary bit. Focus on the romanticism of thing of the story. and that's yellow journalism and it ends up just being nothing but cash and that happened in 1912 and it still happens to this very day absolutely sarah that is so well said and you bring up yellow journal journalism that was if you look at history yellow journalism covers that period and of course you know it takes its name from the color of the paper but she also did other newspaper accounts which she got paid for that were over romanticized and ridiculous. Like today, researchers think th those should be dismissed. And the one that she did in my hometown paper was more accurate. But you know, it was like, oh, the humanity and the stokers coming up covered in black coal dust and beating the children under their feet with stoke irons. And it's over romanticized um, it, yellow jur journalism, exactly what you said. I mean, brilliant absolutely agree 100% with what you just said. I never really thought of it like when I was doing my early research, but then oh, during the making of the documentary, it's just so clear and it just feels like it, it makes you think twice about the story and you want to um, be um, diving into the reality of it. So um, between the two of us, we're always hungry for knowledge and we're always hungry for like the truth of the history compared to what people actually want to believe. It is an amazing story, even if I had no connection whatsoever to the story as a person also who's interested in, in history, you know, you can't help but be drawn to the story. It is, on the face of it, outrageous, interesting, fascinating. Uh, when, you, when you learn a little bit more about it, it is even more outrageous, more unbelievable, the truth of it. Uh, and there's just, it's like peeling an onion. The more you learn about it, the more you can't believe how much there is to the actual story. But what happens is that people only recognize and have come to love the outer shell of that onion and they will defend it. They will defend it. This is the story that I love and anything that has, you know, subsequently been turned up or looked into more or researched or other evidence is found don't dare it's like a fable it's like a a grim's fairy tale if all of a sudden i tried to you know change it you know it wasn't a big bad wolf it was you know uh a big bad dog you know people would just be like oh my god are you crazy but it is important it is important i guess to have both i want to honor people's absolute love of the story and it has captured their imagination i don't want to take that away i don't want people to say oh well you're you know a wet blanket i used to love the story and now you're making me hate it i certainly don't want that um and there's certainly it seems like levels you know people on the outside you know the jack and rose people who love that love story great it's wonderful i love that fictional you know thread in in the story I thought it was brilliant I loved it and you know great if that's why you love the story terrific it's wonderful it's it's lovely I enjoyed every minute of the movie and so did my mother um you know great if what you're really interested in is maritime history wow how extraordinary you know the greatest ship in the world the biggest ship in the world the most amazing ship in the world with the greatest technology sinks on its maiden boys voyage amazing. I'm fascinated by maritime history. Whatever aspect of that ship grabs people, um, I'm grateful for. I mean, it, it's certainly in my retirement, keeping me busy doing podcast interviews, and I'm happy to do it if I can also not only 
honor what people love about that, whatever it is, but hopefully make them aware of some other additional research or facts that, you know, they might not be aware of, you know, and if, if people are always, if they don't want to hear about something that challenges this romantic idea of what they've always been so enamored with, they can always change the channel. You know, there's, there's plenty of sources to honor what was in those original history books, which was a lot of not very accurate stories. People can put it wherever they need to and want to and do. That's very, very true. Cause um, uh, I, I always like look at like loads of things really, but especially during like history documentaries and books. The biggest book that I'm still reading at the moment, but it's proven to be brilliant research and it's um, On a Sea of Glass. And a lot of people who I come across to me, it is the holy grail for Titanic enthusiasts. Everything you want to know about the Titanic, it's there. And it, it just really makes you think that there's so many books that being, well, they keep updating them. And the updates are very important because um, there might have been a few changes that people might not know about. And this is exactly, exactly. why it's so important. I'm so glad you, I, I mean, I actually was wondering what you read because you sound really well informed. That is one of my favorite books. And I'm very familiar. And Bill Wormstadt is one of the, the authors of that. And, um, you know, he's one of the ones that now thinks that she was not in 13 and why. Um, and yet the, one of the reasons that book is so good, in my opinion, and I, every chance I get, I like to push that book and endorse it is because it is based on primary source research and every fact that's in it is in assiduously and pristine condition in appendices in the back of that book. And you can trace the provenance of every statement and you can decide for yourself based on where it came from. And that is what needs to happen in the story to really take it for people who may be a little skeptical to get on board and really believe this research. It's always very important and always very vital. And then we're, we're always going to have to end the podcast here. But um, I have been asking this question by so many people and uh, and a lot of people have been confused by this question because um, I know um, there are some people say, oh, I don't know. Or there have been some people say, yes, I'll add to, to that really. And um, I think um, David Heisman actually in the past interviews said he actually um, gave um, a really good answer to this but Shelley in your opinion for the last question how do you think the Titanic should be remembered because uh, as we know that the Titanic is disappearing under the water and a lot of people are debating because if the Titanic disappears would her history be erased entirely it's an interesting question you know I I was contacted by um, a few people sources when they were talking about recovering the Marconi equipment. And I'm, I want to be very careful and I want to be very clear here because um, I know people, I've become very good friends with many, many uh, other descendants and 1,496 people lost family members and were not as lucky as me. I did not lose any family there. And, you know, some people do think of it as a grave, as a, um, you know, a site that needs to be um, preserved. I'm very careful because um, if they feel that way, they're certainly entitled to that feeling. And, I, you know, as I said, gratefully, my family lived and I'm very grateful for that fact. And I, I feel like I have to be very careful here. I don't feel like I have the right to to say how I feel about uh, what happens to her. I think they have more of a, of a say, especially if their family wasn't recovered or it is gonna disappear. Um, I, I go back and forth in my mind about, you know, so they'd have to go in through a deck house and, receive, and kind of tear things apart to get that Marconi equipment. Should they do that? And I think, well, I mean, that does kind of interest me because if it weren't for the Marconi equipment, I wouldn't be sitting here having this conversation. Again, I, I just feel like I need to, 
to be grateful. And I am grateful. I don't think it's my place to say what should happen to it. it nature's going to have its way anyway. Um, my, my mother and my grandmother and my great grandmother used to always say, I, you know, somewhere down there is a, is a, uh, a trunk full of mint in China. And the stuff that she had with her t- to, to make her new life. And I sure wish I had that. You know, so if they ever find it, I want my, you know, the mint in China. I don't know. I'll just leave it as it's not for me to to say I what should happen to it. I didn't I did it's not a grave to me and it is to some other people and I I I respect that. And I think we're gonna actually wrap up here. Shelly, thank you so much for coming on today. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you, Sarah. It's been great. And as I said before, I'm I'm very impressed because you certainly know um, a lot about this story and I, I do appreciate that and the book on a sea of glass I, I will say right now as a descendant a great book very accurate primary source uh, research material and it's what people if they're serious about ongoing research and the truth and not just the romanticized uh, version of the Titanic great book to have. I'd still be continuing to read it really because um, it, it's always going to be a very special um, one for any enthusiast really and uh, mm-hmm. yeah Shelley thank you so much and um, until then everybody we'll go for a leave right there and I'll be back tomorrow for another Titanic episode. Take care of yourselves, bye! <laughs>